Good day, everyone. Welcome to our lecture today on Jean-Jacques Rousseau's The Social Contract. So for our outline, we'll briefly discuss who was Jean-Jacques Rousseau, background of his political theory, the social contract, general considerations, conclusions, and some guide for discussion. So Rousseau's brief background. He was born in Geneva on June 28, 1712 and died on July 1778 on Ermenonville, Kingdom of France. He left Geneva at the age of 16 to study around France with the help of Madame de Varens, his benefactor and mistress. He wrote the Discourse on Inequality and the Social Contract and was one of the most popular philosophers during the French Revolution. The social contract was about creating a most ideal political community, despite the issues of the society. This work commences with one of the most iconic statements about human life. Man was born free and everywhere he is in chains. Rousseau envisioned the state of nature as a kind of dormancy period. People were free and equal, he theorized but they live mostly solitary lives, feeling little need for others. Though they had sexual relations with one another, they formed no lasting bonds. There existed among them neither cooperation nor conflict. They lived entirely in the present, experiencing only spontaneous drives. Still, they felt a harmony with the world because their desires never exceeded their needs and because they were able to satisfy both needs and desires immediately. They were independent and devoid of aggression toward one another. The notion of a state of nature was a useful fiction. It furnished Susu with theoretical evidence for claiming a radical dichotomy between our present demeaning condition and the Eden we left behind. Here was an original standard against which all future human dislocation could be measured. This vision of the state of nature, moreover, provided Rousseau with a basis for his belief in human perfectibility. Now he could argue that if modern individuals appeared corrupt, unequal and slave, it is society, not human nature, that is to be blamed. So Rousseau's challenge, because of people's vast rational and ethical potential, it was possible and reasonable to propose an alternate route for the social, political, and moral development. This was a challenge Rousseau accepted. He was convinced that it was his mission to chart that course, not backward to the state of nature, but forward toward a more rational, social, and moral Eden. So the ideal society he proposes in the social contract is more than anything else, a communitarian society in which the responsibilities and duties of citizenship outweigh individual rights and freedoms. Selflessly, Citizens bind and commit themselves to the common good of all, willing to make sacrifices for their political community. Their virtue is richly rewarded through their devotion to their community, their self-discipline and patriotism. They thrive as human beings, thus realizing their full rational and moral potential. The citizens of this cohesive community have entered into a stunningly original social pact different from all previous notions of the social contract. Other political thinkers, such as Hobbes, had also surmised that at the basis of societies lay founding contracts. But for these theories, the social pact was always an act of submission. Hobbes, for example, contended that in order to escape from the state of perpetual warfare that existed in the British state of nature, people entered into a pact, a contract, in which they signed away their freedom and all their rights to a sovereign who would rule over them, guaranteeing them life, security, and order. The ruler's power over them was absolute. Rousseau brands these kinds of contracts null and void. Even though the people may have voluntarily consented to the pact, he considered such consent invalid. If one of the parties to a contract is degraded or harmed in any way, the contract he judged is void. People may give up property, he reasoned, 
but they may not consent to give up life or freedom. The essential elements of their humanity. Consent is not sufficient to create legitimate authority. So the essence of the social pact lies in this, that each of us puts his person and all his power in common under the supreme direction of the general will. And we as a body receive each member as an indivisible part of the whole. So what are the elements of the social pact? First, there is a moral collective body produced by and is composed of as many members as there are votes in the assembly, in which by the same act is endowed with its unity, its common self, its life, and its will. Next is the republic or body politic. Is the public person that is formed in this way by the union of all the others. It once bore the name city. Its members call it the state when it is passive, the sovereign when it is active, and a power when comparing it with its like. Next element is the people, which is the name given to the associates collectively taken to refer to themselves. Or they're also called citizens when they consider as being participants in sovereign authority. Another name given to them is subjects, when the people is considered as being bound by the laws of the state. But these terms are often confused and one is taken for another. It is enough to know how to distinguish between them on the occasions when they are applied with complete precision. So we come to the sovereign. It will be seen from the formulation above that the act of association involves a reciprocal commitment between public and private persons, each individual enters on a contract with himself, so to speak, and becomes bound in a double capacity, namely towards other individuals in as much as he is a member of the sovereign and towards the sovereign in as much as he is a member of the state. So what are the features of the sovereign? They cannot put the sovereign under any obligation towards itself and in consequence, it is contrary to the nature of the body politic that the sovereign should impose on itself a law that it cannot infringe. But since the body politic or the sovereign derives its being solely from the sanctity of the contract, it cannot oblige it itself to do anything that derogates from this original deed, for instance, to alienate some portion of itself or to submit to some other sovereign. To violate the act for which it exists would be to destroy itself, and that which is nothing can give rise to nothing. As soon as the multitude is united thus in one body, it is impossible to injure one of its members without attacking the body, and still less to injure the body without its members being affected. Hence, duty and self-interest oblige both contracting parties equally to give each other mutual assistance, and the same individuals must seek in their double capacity to take advantage of all the benefits which depend on it. The sovereign then, consisting solely of the individual persons which form it, has and can have no self-interest that is contrary to theirs. As a result, it does not need to give any form of guarantee to its subjects because it is impossible that the body should want to harm all its members and as we and as we shall see later, it cannot harm anyone individually. Simply by virtue of its existence, the sovereign is always what it should be. So a very important concept that we must remember in Rousseau is the idea of the general will, which means the will of the body politic to seek the realization of what is good for everyone. It can be interpreted as contrary to the personal wills of each individual in the society. It might be the case that he would thus enjoy the rights of a citizen while declining to fulfill the duties of a subject. An example of injustice, which if it were, if it were to spread, would bring the ruin of the body politic. So in order, therefore, that the social pact should not be an empty formula, it contains an implicit obligation which alone can give force to the others. That if anyone refuses to obey the general will, he will be compelled to do so by the whole body, which means nothing else than that he will be forced to be free. For such is the condition which, giving each citizen to his country, 
guarantees that he will not depend on any person. This condition is the device that ensures the operation of the political machine. It alone legitimizes civil obligations, which without it would be absurd and tyrannical and subject to the most terrible abuses. So the passage in the social contract gives justice and moral quality to human behavior. In civil society, man is now compelled to act based on rational principles. And in surrendering some of his natural advantages, he gains the freedom and intelligence to be fully human as opposed to being a stupid and limited animal. His faculties exercised and improved, his ideas amplified, his feelings and and his entire soul raised so much higher. So by comparing the state of nature in the civil society, what man loses by the social contract is his natural freedom and limited only by the strength of the individual. Whereas man gains civil freedom limited by the general will in civil society. In the state of nature, there is an unlimited right to anything by which he is tempted and can obtain. Merely the effect of force or the right of the first occupant. While on the other hand, in civil society, there is the right of property over everything that he possesses, founded only on positive entitlement. So where does it all lead? For Rousseau, the end is basically human, moral, liberty, and freedom. And he says, and this is to end this lecture, to the acquisition of moral status could be added on the basis of what has just been said. The acquisition of moral liberty this being the only thing that makes man surely the master of himself. For to be driven by our appetites alone is slavery, while to obey a law that we have imposed on ourselves is freedom. So that would be Rousseau's idea of the social contract in a summary. Hope to see you on our next lecture. Good day, everyone.